So we're going to cover some topics that Gilmore handled in earlier stages of the work. I mean, in other words, we've gone sort of past his discussion of covering groups with the intention of coming back. I'm sort of rearranging the order of things for whatever reason. But covering groups is really important because while you're studying this, you'll, you're always going to hear things like SU2 is the universal covering group of SO3. And you, you want to understand that. You want to be comfortable with that idea. And I don't quite think Gilmore's level, if that's the only thing you knew, would quite get you to comfort with this concept. It's more important in general because it's always true that there is, in this theory of league groups, there's always going to be a universal covering group for every league group out there. And, of course, some league groups may themselves be the universal covering group of a family of league groups. But we got to get down to the basics of what this actually means. Unfortunately, this requires topology, specifically the topology of covering spaces. And I, I in concert with my overall philosophy here, we're going to cover that. So we're going to fill in the gap uh, and, and make it so that we have really good handle on this idea of universal covering groups and why they are the way they are. So the first two things we're going to uh, review are these ideas, the connected components of a Lie group and the invariant subgroups of a Lie group. We're going to identify how those things, what those things, two things might mean. So you might remember the way we just started this whole pro pro project was we identified a group, G, which we were later to learn was a Lie group as we slowly gave it more and more properties. But in its basic step, it's a group. So every element of the group you know, satisfies all of the group axioms. You know, here are just some of those axioms, right? There's there's closure, there, an inverse exists for all A, and it equals the identity, which is a member of the group, and it's associative, and all of these axioms. That those are all, every element of the group satisfies these axioms. So there's this binary operation, all of that stuff. Um, but of course, our, our our Lie group was also, was also a topological space. So the Lie group has a, a topology on it. So it's a topological space, and it's really cool. And in this topological space, what's the way the topology is created is so that the group operation is continuous. So if I write the group operation as, say, phi acting on A and B, this function phi is continuous. And also the uh, operation of producing an inverse is continuous. That means... Uh, uh, the map that goes from A to A inverse, that's a continuous map. And once you did that, you now had a continuous group that was a Lie group and a topological space. So it's two things. It's a topological space and a group. I guess what I'll do is, you know what, I'm going to make all the top topological features red and the group features black to show you that it's a combination of things. Now, I'm kind of choosing these things to be red. I might get a topology only exists for topological space, so that's all red. The function phi actually exists whether the topological space exists or not, because phi is just a way of rewriting the group operation, right? So, you know, if I write a dot b for the group operation, phi a b, you know, that's just another way of writing the group operation. What makes the group operation so important is that the topology, the topological structure of this group G has to be such that this, these two functions, the group operation function and the, uh, uh, the, the mapping from every element to its inverse, those have to be continuous mappings. So in order for them to be continuous mappings, then uh, you have to have a topology designed to make it so. So... Uh, it's not just an. Uh, it's not the fact that the function phi exists. It's the topology is defined in a way where the function phi is continuous under the rules of topology, which is what we discussed a couple lectures ago. But then we demanded even more. We demanded that we could find a mapping. A mapping. Let's see. I'll just do that in black. We define. We demanded that we could find mappings. I guess I'll call them charts. Right u i gamma i and those charts would take this manifold this uh, uh, topological space and make it a manifold 
And I'll draw that this way because we've been exploring the uh, RN space using this sort of uh, using SU2 and SU3, which map to sort of these spheres or these circles. And now in, the, in our case, what we did, interestingly, is uh, one map put I at the origin. And what we didn't do is we didn't create a second map for the work we did in the past few lectures, but we could have. Right? I could have done uh, a second mapping, and if I had done that, then this wouldn't have been UI. All right, let me, let me just be a little more specific, right? This would have been, say, whoops, this would have been U1, gamma 1, and then this would have been U2, gamma 2. And this wouldn't have been I, this would have been minus I, right? We would have set everything up at minus I. And the, the coordinate system here would be completely fine up to the surface of the sphere. Then it's no good. Then you can't use this mapping. But this coordinate system would be completely good at I, which equates to the surface of the sphere here, but uh, it's no good at, uh, I'm sorry, this, this coordinate system, would, its origin would be minus I, which equates to the surface of this sphere. And uh, this coordinate system would begin at, minus i and at the surface of the sphere that would be the identity i right that that was sort of the way we did it for uh uh so3 and su2 i'm trying to make this a general picture so this is not absolutely true for an arbitrary group i just i'm using these circles and i and minus i as an example of this is a manifold. Manifolds have charts. Charts go to different regions of Rn. The charts in principle overlap and uh, this is what establishes a coordinate system on the manifold. And I'm using this, matter of fact, I'm going to erase this I and minus I now just to make sure we have everything in complete generality. Uh, but even the sphere isn't really completely general because you could imagine some group, Lie group, top, uh, topological Lie group, well, topological Lie group is a redundant, but a Lie group that... Um, you know, it, it doesn't have a problem at pi and 2 pi, right? Uh, for example, the one we did in our elementary example that had to do with uh, the translations and rotation, uh, the translations of, uh, of a coordinate system, right? That doesn't have anything to do with pi. Okay, so what we discovered is now we started adding up all of this stuff, right? We got this group. It was a topological space. In addition to being a topological space, it happened to be a manifold. Now, the, each of these things is different, right? Each of these things is no, – no one thing implies another, right? Being a group is not a prior necessity to being a topological space. So if you are a group – it's interesting, certain groups, certain groups are topological spaces, and those and Lie groups are among those. Not all topological spaces can be turned into manifolds, but some can. Lie groups can. So Lie groups are not only topological groups, but they're also manifolds. So now we've got this structure going on. And then what else did we learn? Well, we also discovered that there was this thing called the Lie algebra, and the Lie algebra had generators. Let's call them xi. They had a commu uh, essentially a commutation relation, right? Um, let's see. How did that work? It was c i j k x k, where we're summing over indices that are both lower. Remember, it's not space time stuff, so you can sum over lower indices. And we learned that the uh, Lie group and the Lie algebra are related through this process called exponentiation, right? Exponentiation. And that would help us generate these, uh, these Lie groups. So we learned about that. And this is an algebra, right? This is an algebra, which is a, yet a different uh, algebraic structure. It's different, it's different from a group. It's different from a topological space. It's, yeah, it's, it's, well, we studied it in great detail, but this is sort of where we kind of realize, all right, now we kind of understand how all this stuff fits together mathematically. Then we just recently went even a little farther. What we discovered now was that if you look at this topological space, if it's got the right path connectedness properties, there's actually another group out there associated with this thing. And that we call the fundamental group. 
Now, there is a question of how do we how do we understand the fundamental group relative to all of this stuff, right? And that's really going to be uh, the topic of today's lecture. This it's definitely a uh, the fundamental group is a separate group, right? It's a it's a mathematical structure that you know is, we have to identify it independently of anything else. It has to be a known mathematical structure, but it's a property of G, right? This is the Lie group of G. Uh, this is the Lie algebra of the Lie group G. This is the fundamental group of the Lie group G. These two things are more independent, though. It, the Lie algebra is a completely independent sort of set that can be used to understand and create the Lie group. The fundamental group of the Lie group is actually like a property of this topological space. The fundamental group of the, the, the topological space of our Lie group actually has a certain fundamental group, right? It's this guy is not a subset of this group, nor is it something we necessarily care about living outside the group. It's simply a property like, oh, like you might say, the Lie group is uh, simply connected. The Lie group is, or it or not, or the Lie group is, um, uh, you know, it has this top topology to it. You would say the fundamental group of this particular Lie group is this thing, this pi one. So you actually might, you might take the fundamental group and you might sort of put it in here. The problem with that is it makes it look like it's some sort of subgroup and it's not a subgroup. It's sort of a property. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to float it out here because it's a property. And I think what I'll do is I'll bind it with these little lines, not uh, something of that nature, right? And that's just is all just a way to sort of organize this stuff in your mind. Now, the good news is there are certain other groups that are very important to understanding the core Lie group, right? Uh, the fundamental group is one of them. But it's unusual in that it's not a subset, like I said. But there are some subsets of any Lie group that are really important to call out. And we haven't done that yet. So that's where we're going to break a little new ground today. And those subsets are, of course, subgroups of G. And in particular, the ones we care about are the invariant subgroups of G. So as a reminder, we studied invariant subgroups in detail in Lesson 21. And the big point was that invariant subgroups are usually the, well, they're always the kernel of a homomorphism. So those things, you, you have to understand that stuff, right? You, you can't really go on unless you understand about the idea of a kernel of a group homomorphism. And I'll emphasize group homomorphism. We've already talked about homeomorphisms. And homeomorphisms are topological properties. Homomorphisms are group, or homeomorphisms are topological maps. Homomorphisms are group maps. These are unrelated except that they've got this home in the beginning and ism at the end, right? But mathematically, these are profoundly different ideas. And it's easy to confuse this stuff, especially when you start blending everything together. The problem is, is our Lie group is a blend of a group and a topological space. So our Lie group can have homeomorphisms to other topological spaces because any map from a topological space to another topological space could be, in principle, a homeom or could, in po could possibly be a homeomorphism. And, but it's a group, and as a group, it probably does have some homomorphism mapping between it and another group. So... We are interested in knowing the invariant subgroups of G because that will help us understand all of the possible group homomorphisms that are out there. Again, uh, this stuff here, all in Lesson 21. All right, so now we'll take a moment to look at G. Now we're getting back into sort of, we've caught up with ourselves, and now we're going to get back into what Gilmore is talking about that we need to start reconstructing. So Gilmore takes a look now at, whoops, Gilmore takes a close look at this topological group G, and considering it as a topological space, one of the properties of a topological space is the property of connectedness. So it may be that the topological group G, I'll just put it as G, I guess, T, G, right? Where G is the set and T is the topology of the set, and the set also happens to be a group. Um, 
it could have one component, which basically means the uh, it's connected. It's totally connected. And connected uh, in the topological sense means that you can't find two subgroups A and B such that A intersection B is whoops is uh, the null set and the entire group G equals A union B right that's what connectedness is so it could be that G is connected and we you can kind of think of that as sort of like a a, a piece of the plane or or a, the plane because that's all connected. We've already discussed there's also this notion of path connectedness, which is very, very closely related to connectedness. But, you know, top, topology is weird. and You know, there's path connected spaces or there's there's uh, connected spaces that are not path connected and and really dysfunctionally weird stuff that we don't have to worry about. But uh, this space could be connected and we would maybe uh, uh, indicate it this way. Now, it is our group, right? So... Somewhere in this group, there would be the identity element. Let's see if I can. Uh, the identity element would be in there, right? That's one element of our of our group. But it may, in fact, be that G is not connected. In fact, G doesn't have to be connected at all. G could be disconnected, and if it's disconnected, we might some we might have to add some disconnected components. And I'm doing these as planes because. That's how uh, Gilmore does it. But I guess in principle, we could have done it just in abstract form where I could have said, okay, this is the connect. This is one component of G. This is another component of G. This is another component of G. This is another component of G. Uh, but the, but this is the set G, right? So the, the elements don't appear multiple times. So the identity might appear here. That's always important to know which of the connected components the identity goes in. Because only that component, only the connected component with the identity can be a group. Now, just to be clear, Gilmore, when he draws these guys as little planes like this, uh, instead of, uh, you know, instead of abstract uh, set circles, he's already making a nod to the idea that, remember, don't forget, the Lie group is a manifold, and a manifold can be given a coordinate system, and they're always homeomorphic locally chart by chart to rn and that's kind of what he's doing he's basically skipping the step where if you know if i did it my way i'd have to say okay so there's a bunch of charts u gamma you know for each one of these things there's a bunch of charts so keep track of the fact that each of these are manifolds so we can skip all that by just using planes to begin with and understand behind all of that is this whole manifold logic i keep emphasizing that because I want these words to sort of sink into the people watching this lecture. Manifolds are a type of topological space. Our group happens to be a topological space. And then there's this algebra floating around out there. Our topological space has a associated fundamental group that's based on, you know, that whole thing about paths. And um, we're going to study this a lot more soon. But, you know, the... The idea that manifolds are there to give us coordinate systems, that's reflected in these ideas of planes. So we'll go back to Gilmore's way. See, so here we have some planes. I'll see if I can move this over, make a few more. Okay, so this might be a picture of a disconnected Lie group, right? And it's still a, a group, right? So there's still like an element here, you know, A, and then an element here, B, and the product is somewhere in the Lie group, right? Maybe over there, C, I suppose. But what is important to understand is that um, the identity lives on this particular sheet. And that is the one sheet that has to be a subgroup, right? That sheet has to be a subgroup of the entire Lie group. And in fact, that sheet not only is a subgroup, but it is also an invariant subgroup, right? So this is a, in, so the whole Lie group is the union of all of these things. But this piece, this disconnected sheet that contains the identity, if there is one, that must be an invariant subgroup of the entire group G. So if we called, say, if I called that H, I would then write H is an invariant subgroup of G. Uh, well, let's stick with Gilmore's notation. We'll call that G sub zero. G sub zero is the uh, connected uh, 
component, the connected component that contains the identity. So now we recall the fact that any group, for example, our group G, uh, you can form all of the cosets with an invariant subgroup, and that would become what we call the factor group. The factor group is the set of cosets uh, of the invariant uh, the invariant subgroup of that we're interested in, which is G0 in this case. That is going to be a factor group, which we will call, as Gilmore does, D. And it's always going to be, in the case of a lead group, D will be a discrete group. Now notice G is a continuous group itself. In fact, G is also a manifold, as reflected by this plane. And each of these disconnected components, right, each of these guys, they're also manifolds. Because remember, this is a topological space. So it's each of these disconnected components are also topological spaces, and they're also all manifolds. And in fact, they're all identical. They're all equivalent as manifolds. This manifold is, an, is structured exactly the same way as this one and the same way as this one. They're all structured as manifolds in the same way. But only this one is also a group. In fact, so this is now a group and a manifold, and it has a Lie algebra, so it fits all of this stuff here. But none of these do. None of these are groups because the identity lives here. It doesn't live in any of those planes, so they can't be groups. So, uh, but nevertheless, being a group, right, being group G and having identified an invariant subgroup, uh, then uh, uh, we can form the this factor group. So G D is the factor group of the... Lie group G through its uh, through the uh, connected the, the connected portion that contains the identity, which is G zero. Now, for the next part, I want to warn you that again, I think uh, back in lesson, well, I can't remember what lesson it was. Probably less around lesson twenty one. Uh, I was critical of Gilmore's description of the factor group in his book, and that criticism sort of continues on here. So I'm going to explain <clears throat> sort of my corrected interpretation of how this actually works, right? But the point is, is if I go to each of these groups, if e each of these, not groups, but each of these uh, disconnected pieces, and I find an example element in each one. So I might find an example element here. I'll call it, well, here I'll choose the identity uh, I, and I'll call that element D0, and, well, D's not a good choice. That sort of falls into this error. I'm going to call this uh, G's little g0. Then I pick an element here, and I call that little g1. And I pick an element here, and that'll be little g2. And this will be little g3. And here will be, say, little g4. Right? So this, this disconnected component is going to be the coset little g1 on g0. Right? Uh, why, why am I putting it there? Let me uh, let me uh, move it here. That's going to be little g1, g0. I'll shrink it up a little bit. And this the um, this other connected component is going to be little g2 on g0. And this connected component will be uh, little g3 group operation. G zero, and then of course G four group operation G zero. Now it doesn't obviously it doesn't matter because since G is a invariant subgroup, I could have written G zero dot G three, right? It's because of it's not it's not that everything it's not that this group commutes, but the subgroup generated by multiplying from the left is equal to the subgroup generated by multiplying from the right. Okay, so each of these uh, disconnected components. Is the is a coset is a, is a that's this is the definition of a coset right is it is a coset by the invariant subgroup, and those cosets will also form this factor group. That's what this factor group is, right? And uh, and that's an important point to understand is that the total group G is described fully by this little plane here, and also by the factor group that uh, uh, it creates with the entire group. The factor group that the invariant subgroup, the connected 
component of the group G that has the identity. That invariant subgroup creates a factor group. So understanding this invariant subgroup of a group G and the factor group really gets you to pretty much understanding everything. Now, just to be clear about my objection to the way Gilmore does this, and I'll, I'll just alert you to it, and you can make of it what you will. He, he basically asserts that the group D is a set that has elements D0, D1, D, you know, D whatever, Dn, right? And then he talks about the ith connected component equals Di G0. And this is hugely problematic, right? Because D is a group the factor group, and G is part of another group, G. These are not the same group. The factor group is not the same group as the invariant subgroup. So this expression doesn't mean anything because D is not an element of the group G. So when Gilmore writes this down, it's really open to massive confusion, and uh, in my opinion. So the way to understand it is really the way I understood it, is, is this is a... This is the coset, and because the way I've done it, right, is G is an element of the group. So G times G0, this is a perfectly well-defined, uh, this product, G1, G0, that's perfectly well-defined because G is an element of the group. Little G1 is an element of the group G, and G0 is a subgroup of the group G. So this is clearly a coset of the group G. But this kind of means it, it doesn't make any sense. Now, it's it's somewhere half making some logic. I mean, the way he draws the pictures in the book are actually, you know, somewhat okay. But again, you know, it, he's using. In fact, the way he draw, draws the picture, literally, he puts the elements D inside the plane, right? D D four, right? This would have been D three. But D is an element of the factor group, which is not. The group, so they they don't belong in these sets. It's just terribly confusing. But nevertheless, the general point that he's trying to make is still absolutely valid, which is that the factor group D uh, and understanding the invariant subgroup of uh, the the understanding this particular invariant subgroup, because there could be other invariant subgroups, right? G is a, a group that could have a lot of complex structure. It has if it's if it was disconnected, it will have a uh, connected component that does have the identity. So it will always have a sort of G0, but it could have other. In fact, it will have other invariant subgroups. I mean, we're, we're going to see a few examples of that. But this, so it's not the invariant subgroup, it's an invariant subgroup. So if I've been saying the invariant subgroup, that's not good. It should be an invariant subgroup. All right, so another important element of this narrative, this story, is that if this group G is of this structure, meaning it is a uh, disconnected group. If it's disconnected, it is certainly not simply connected, right? Obviously, simply connected, well, as a reminder, you can simply connected means you can not only create a path from any point to any other point, but the fundamental group is the identity, right? So in this circumstance, the fundamental group would not be the identity. And that should be painfully obvious because if I started a loop here, right, that loop uh, would certainly be a homeomorphic, uh, 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 homo, uh, uh, homotopic, homotopic. There's homeomorphic homologous and homotopic. We haven't talked about homology, but um, that's certainly uh, homo, uh, homotopic to the constant. And if I did that here too, that would be homotopic to a constant. And, and each of these would be, each of these pieces as I've drawn them are simply connected, right? Uh, the way I've drawn it as a plane, right? But the fact that you have five of them means the group as a whole is not simply connected, right? I, I guess the way to say it is, let me be formal. In order to be simply connected, you first must be path connected, right? So... If, if your space isn't even path connected, it's never going to be simply connected. So a requirement for sim simple connectedness means that the fundamental group of the topological space is the identity group, just the trivial group. But you don't even bother to check that if the space isn't path connected in the first place. And remember, path connectedness was really important because 
in order to establish a fundamental group for the entire space, right, what we had to do was we had to say, okay, so here's our space. Let's pick a point. <coughs> Excuse me. So we pick a point, you know, A, and then we start playing around with all these paths, you know, looking for holes in the space or whatever it is that obstructs the uh, ability to be homotopic. And then we calculate the homotopy group around the point A. Sometimes this is called a pointed, a pointed space, right? A pointed space is given as the space X, if I call that X, and a point A, right? And so uh, this might be called a pointed space. But the point problem is, or the point is, no pun intended, is that I could do this for another point B. And gee, do I, you know, how do I know that the homotopy uh, uh, group is the same for every point? And there's a proof that says, well, if the space is path connected, I can create paths between the points and then the loops and the paths can combine in a fashion that proves that you'll get the same group no matter what point you have. And then we talk about the fundamental group of the set, not the fundamental group of the set and a point. But this path connectedness is critical to that proof, right? So you can't talk about the fundamental group of a topological space unless it's path connected. So if we go back to this, clearly this isn't path connected. You can't connect from this this uh, connected component to that connected component with a, a continuous path. So it's not path connected, and this space is not simply connected. And even if it was path connected, by the way, it still may not be simply connected because the fundamental group may not be just isomorphic to the trivial group. It might be more like the one we studied before, which was isomorphic to the uh, 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 group of I and the identity, which I think you know, is, uh, what would we call that? I think we would just call that Z2, isomorphic to Z2, which is the integers modulo 2. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, isomorphic. So uh, what was the point of that? So the point of that is uh, um, each of the components can be understood as uh, being uh, simply connected, right? Uh, you don't have to, by the way, I mean, you don't have to have the identity be simply connected, right? This is a topological space. It's a manifold. It has its own homotopy group. So having a homotopy group is related to the topological property of our Lie group, not related to the group property of the Lie group. So, um, uh, so each of these individual sheets are simply connected, but the thing as a whole is not simply connected. All right, so let's go back and now see if we can start incorporating these ideas into our sort of a grand rubric of where we are, which I repeat over and over and over again, I know. But um, so now I'm going to add this. You'll notice one thing I've done is I've added G0 into this sort of list of things that describe G. And what I'm trying to show here is that this Lie group G will have a connected component that includes the identity. Now, it could be that that's the only component, right? That It could be that our Lie group G just has the identity and that's it, right? There are no other planes out there, right? There are no other disconnected components. And if that's the case, then G would, um, uh, in principle, have whatever, uh, con whatever um, uh, uh, homotopy property that G0 has, right? It would be the same. G would equal G0 is essentially what it would be. But if that's not the case, if it's not the case, then uh, G0 would just be a invariant subgroup of G. It'd be a continuous invariant subgroup of G. And the way I reflect that is that the topological stuff's in red, right? So G0 is a manifold, just like G is, and um, or each component of G would be a manifold, right? And uh, uh, so I cut it out and I give it, it has a topological structure that it inherits from G. And so it's inside this little red line, which encapsulates a lot of the topology. Um, but then I'm allowing for these other things, D1, D2, to DR. And what are they? Well, G may have, in addition to this discrete invariant subgroup, right? Um, or this, I'm sorry, this invariant subgroup, which is not discrete. It may have discrete invariant subgroups. That means the subgroups of, subgroups of G that have a discrete number of elements 
And those discrete number of elements form a legitimate no kidding subgroup. And that's what I mean by this. We don't know how many there might be. We'll call R. We'll say D, that's a little r. So there's D1, D2, all the way through a little r, different invariant discrete subgroups. Hey, you know, as far as I know, there may be even more continuous ones, right? But there's at least one. It's either the whole group or the uh, connected component connecting the identity. And there could be we not necessarily must be, but there could be these discrete invariant subgroups as well. So, um, uh, given that, uh, I've thrown them in there because they would they would be discrete, so they don't have the same topology. So they're kind of outside the topology of G, but they're inside the group nature of G. Hours. So they're inside this uh, this black structure. Uh, what would be an example of that? Well, we've already discussed one example of it, right? It turns out, well, we've seen that we've seen this group, I and uh, all right. So we we can take a quick example of what might be a discrete invariant subgroup. Let's look at um, groups we've been working with, uh, uh, SO SO three and SU two, right? In both of those, those are matrix groups, right? These are matrix groups. So both of those matrix groups certainly have the identity matrix, and they certainly have the opposite of the identity matrix, right? Those are two elements, right? These are both elements of, uh, they're elements of SO3 and SU2, right? Where, of course, this is two by two matrices, and these are three by three matrices. But these two el groups, these two, uh, transformations or the uh, are elements of these two different groups. So in both cases, I could create the subset of I and minus I, and that would be a group using the standard group operations of the parent groups, right? Because, because um, I squared equals I minus I squared equals I and I minus I equals minus I, right? It's closed, it's associative, it's got all the properties of being a group, and it's also discrete, right? It's got a, in fact, it's finite. It's even better than discrete, it's finite, right? So it's clearly discrete, it's clearly a subgroup of these two groups. Now the question is, is it invariant, right? Is it invariant? Well, what's the test for invariance? Well, if you take an arbitrary group element, you multiply by these candidate discrete invariant subgroup, and then you multiply by the inverse of the element, do you get the candidate group back, right? That's one of the tests, right? Which is the equivalent of A, H equals H, A, right? With the group operation in here, um, where H is, uh, where I'm defining this with H, right? So if you do that test, you'll see right away, yes, this is a uh, discrete invariant Invariant. This is definitely an invariant subgroup because clearly AI and minus AI is A and minus A, and uh, and A times A inverse will be I, and minus A times A inverse will be minus I. So you get the group right back. So this is definitely an invariant discrete invariant subgroup. So that's an example of this. What's curious? What's curious though is that this discrete invariant subgroup. This discrete invariant subgroup, where did we see it before, right? I mean, I just derived it by looking at SO3 and SU2, and I said, ah, you know what? Uh, I'm looking for a discrete invariant subgroup. This is a pretty easy candidate, and I just pulled it out, and I did the quick test, and yeah, sure enough. But where have I seen it before? Well, it was also the fundamental group of SO3. Remember that? Of course you do. That was our last lecture. The fundamental group of SO3 was also I minus I. Well, how did I derive that? Well, that was a pain in the butt process. I had to go and uh, look over here, right? I had to go, you know, start at the, I had to, first I had to, st first I had to study the group. I had to make the group, I had to t take a look at the group. I had to topolo topologize the group I had by uh, using the fact that it was a manifold. I created a manifold. I established a coordinate system. I played around with the coordinate system a bit. I chose this sort of pseudo chart, meaning that I allow this circle to be a bit redundant in the coordinate system, but I don't mind. Um, and then I kind of made this path. And I said, all right, there's paths homotopic to the identity. 
Yeah, oh, but look, wow, this is weird. This path here is not homotopic to the identity. And then I said, oh, you know what? If I do that even more and more, uh, I only get two kinds of paths, those that are homotopic to the identity and those that are um, uh, homotopic to the uh, to a path to a, a path that intersects the sphere once. And I went through all that analysis last time, right? And from that, I concluded that the topological structure of G yielded me this group. Well, it's kind of interesting that this group, I minus I, is buried in SU2 and SO3, and those two groups share the same Lie algebra, right? And that's a little bit odd, right? I mean, we, we, we derived a discrete invariant subgroup by looking at purely the group properties of SO2, SO3, and SU2, but we derived what happens to be the same group by looking entirely at the properties of the topological space SO3. Not SU2, right? SU2, when you did this, you ended up with just the trivial group, but it was only SO3. So it wasn't both. Now, this could be a coincidence, right? There, I mean, there aren't that many super, super simple groups, right? So if it could easily be a coincidence that that's the case. Turns out it is not a coincidence. It is not a coincidence that the discrete invariant subgroup of SU2, right, the discrete invariant subgroup of SU2, right, that SU2 has a discrete invariant subgroup that is the same as the hum, uh, fundamental group of SO3. That is a related concept. It's not coincidental. Now, it is a bit coincidental that SO3 has a discrete invariant subgroup that's equal to its own fundamental group, right? I don't know about that so much, but I do know that the fact that SU2's discrete invariant subgroup is equal to SO3's fundamental group, that is a very profound and deep concept that we're going to finish the lecture here to, uh, discussing. So, I mean, it, it is a puzzle. I mean, it could be a coincidence. Maybe it is because if you think about it, I mean, this is groups of loops, groups of equivalence classes. The topology of this is established by continuity, and it just doesn't seem like that analysis is at all related to the fact that these two things have a certain discrete invariant subgroup. This is all done by group and algebra. This is all algebraic, right? I'll even write that down. This is all algebraic, and this is all topological. But as usual, this subject binds these two ideas together in a very, very unexpected way. And this is the first really, really unexpected thing. In fact, in, when I started learning the subject, this was the first point where I was like, wow, this is really, really amazing how this stuff uh, can actually uh, connect these completely different branches of mathematics. This is the first time I was really like impressed by that. Before, I was always maybe, maybe too cynical or too young to really appreciate uh, the, these kind of connections. But here it is. This is going to be our, our, hopefully you'll get the same feeling out of it that I got, which is, whoa, that actually is worth coming to understand. So our next kind of puzzle is we're going to try to figure out why we have two groups that have the same Lie algebra, right? And of those two groups, one of them has a discrete invariant subgroup that is equal to the fundamental group of the other. And we're going to try to understand why that is significant, right? We're going to now go to the explanation, or not the explanation, I guess. We're going to go to the statement of the relationship. And uh, that's our next topic. Okay, so in this lecture, what we covered was... Um, the, these two ideas, these two ideas, our goal is to kind of get through this idea where SU2 is the universal covering group. And now we're set up. We understand all about the invariant subgroups of a Lie group. We understand about the fundamental group. So now I can go through the, uh, the, the theorems, the definitions that establish SU2 as a universal covering group of a certain class of Lie groups. And that's going to be our next lecture.